CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. I go to seek on many roads what is to be, true heart and strong, with love to light. Will they not bear me in the fight to order, shun, or wield, or mold my destiny? Destiny that waits for all of us. But is it cast forever for all of us in frozen letters of stone, or does it change? Can each of us change it? Yes, sir. You're looking at the strongest, most secure vault in the state of Arkansas. Is that a fact, sir? No, the safest, most burglar-proof. Hmm. You ever heard of, uh, Jimmy Valentine? Jimmy Valentine? No. Well, he's only the most famous safe cracker in the whole United States. Well, I'll bet you even he couldn't break in. You know, sir, I'm tempted to take that bet. Well, how could we know that Jimmy Valentine had come down here to try to crack this vault? He might. He might. If you asked him to. Our mystery drama, Jimmy Valentine's Gamble, was adapted from the O. Henry classic, especially for the Mystery Theater, by Sam Dan, and stars Robert Dryden and Paul Hecht. I'll be back shortly with Act One. This is a story by William Sidney Porter, or if you prefer, O. Henry. Everything and everyone was grist to his mill. The basic theme of his life was once expressed by a Roman poet named Terence, who said, I am a man. Nothing human is alien to me. And no human being was ever alien to O. Henry either. Emaciated shop girls, overfed society dowagers, Millionaires, cops, clerks, anyone, everyone. If you had the breath of life, you were one of O. Henry's people. At this time, let us meet one of O. Henry's favorite people, a bright young man named Jimmy Valentine. For further particulars, listen to the master storyteller himself. I met Jimmy Valentine while I was in prison. What was I doing in prison? Well, uh, let me just say this about prison in general. Many of the people who are in it should be out of it, and many of the people who are out of it should be in it. At any rate, this is Jimmy Valentine's story, not mine. I was assigned to work in the dispensary. It was an easy, pleasant job. Well, Jimmy, I see you're getting out tomorrow. Happy days, Billy. I guess you won't be coming in here to the dispensary anymore for my good old toothache remedy. Huh? Oh, I never got a toothache. <laughs> I come in for the lecture. Ed, the lecture? I've heard the lecture from professionals, Billy, from preachers and judges and wardens, but <laughs> none of them even come close to you. Jimmy, I hope you never come back. You're really not a bad fellow at heart. Oh, I am. I am. Stop cracking safes and live straight. I'm the best there is. Look at these fingers. These are the fingers of a genius. Let my fingers touch the lock on a safe, and they just don't feel. Oh, no. They can see. They can hear. And the net result? Jail. If you were smart, you'd give it up. I can't. It's destiny. It's what I was born to do. Nobody's born to be a safe cracker. What were you born to be, Billy? A bank clerk? Huh. Look where it got you. No, I... I don't think I'll work in a bank anymore. A drugstore clerk? I hope not. You see, pal, that's your problem. You don't know your destiny. You call safe cracking a destiny? Well, maybe it ain't exactly. Isn't. Uh, thank you, Billy. Maybe it isn't much of a destiny. But at least I got one. Let me know when you find yours. Well, I found my destiny after a while. It was to go to New York City 
and write stories for magazines and newspapers. And it was a happy destiny. I wished I could tell Jimmy Valentine about it, but I had no idea where to find it. And then one day, a letter arrived. It was from a Mr. Ralph D. Spencer. Who could it be? I didn't know anyone named Ralph D. Spencer. Uh, Dear Billy, Jimmy Valentine is out. Ralph D. Spencer is in. I have gone and done it. I have gone straight. I have become a rube. I have married the dearest, sweetest girl in the world. The only safe I open now is the safe in my very own shoe store. And although I feel like a fool using the combination, (laughs) it's all part of my new life. I had to laugh. The very idea of Jimmy Valentine happily married and the proprietor of a shoe store in a small town. (laughs) Anyhow, I returned to the letter. After he was released from jail, he went straight away to a saloon owned by one Mike Dolan. (laughs) Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy, my boy, what a sight for sore eyes. Have a drink. I'll put away the bourbon, Mike. Oh, that's right. I forgot. You never touch the hard stuff. Can't afford it. Makes your fingers shake. (laughs) A tall glass of seltzer and milk, right? Right. Uh, Yes. I'm sorry you had to stay in jail so long. Oh, four months ain't too bad. And that detective. Yeah, Ben Price. Well, you knocked out a two. Yeah, you shouldn't complain. He gave me a black eye. <laughs> what a beauty of a fight. A beauty. I I meant to ask, why didn't you go along quietly, Jimmy? You always did. I couldn't let him find my tools. Losing those tools would be like losing my arms. <laughs> well, Jimmy boy, they're here. Ready for you. You couldn't buy a set of those tools for a thousand dollars. Well, I believe it. They're made of the finest imported Swedish steel. <laughs> every drill, every punch, jimmy, clamp, auger, uh, plus those uh, little novelties I invented myself. <laughs> they're, they're the envy of the profession. Why, Sully himself said he'd give you two thousand any time he wanted to sell. I wouldn't sell them to Sully for two million. Why not? Because. I don't like him. Uh, what do you got in mind? Well, first I have to pick up the tools, then... Well, the world's my oyster, as they say. Hey. And watch me crack it wide open. And that's what he did. In the early evening, say, 7, 8 o'clock, he would crack open oysters at the finest restaurants in the country. And in the early morning, say, 1 and 2 a.m., he'd crack open safes in some of the best guarded banks in the country. Jimmy always needed that challenge. Now, he mentioned the name Ben Price just before and identified him as a detective. Ben worked for one of the largest insurance companies in the world. I tell you, it's Valentine, Mr. Powell. Valentine? It has to be. Dandy Jimmy Valentine. It's as if he left his signature. Yeah, he is just out of jail, Price. He may have learned his lesson. Yeah, I'll tell you the lesson he learned. Small jobs, never more than a couple of thousands. Small bills, no silver, no securities. Nothing you can trace. It doesn't seem possible. Jimmy Valentine cracking safes for chicken feed? It has to be Valentine. Look at this combination knob jerked out as easy as pulling up a radish in wet weather. He's got the only clamps that can do it. And how clean those tumblers were punched out. He never has to drill more than one hole. Uh, Supposing it is Valentine. No supposing. He's my man. And how do you propose to get him? I'll get him. And he'll do his full bit. I'll chase him the length and breadth of these here entire United States. Can you get him, Price? This time, can you get him? And make it stick? (laughs) I've got to get him. After all, he owes me a tooth. Of course, Jimmy wasn't privy to this particular conversation, but he did know that the thief catchers had been roused against him, especially Ben Price. But Jimmy depended on his luck. Long jumps, quick getaways, 
a taste for good society. Oh, he was a hard man to find. Well, on this particular afternoon, Jimmy got off the train at a town called Elmore, somewhere in the blackjack country of Arkansas. Elmore, of course, had a bank, an interesting bank. And so Jimmy, looking like a nice young traveling salesman, walked down the sidewalk and turned into the hotel. Anyone here? Hello? All right, all right, I hear you. No peace, no quiet, no rest here below. Well, sir, what can I do for you? I was thinking of engaging a room. Engaging? Well, all right. Private bath? Uh, yeah. We don't have one. Bath is down the hall. I'll take it. Without even asking how much. Well, you look like a fair and a reasonable woman. Stop pulling Agatha's hair! Them two should have been born boys more blame trouble. A room's a dollar a day. Right. I'll get boy to carry up your bags. Jefferson? Uh, uh, no, no thanks. Uh, the bags are sort of heavy. Mm, just as well. He's probably off sleeping somewheres anyhow. Mind signing the register? Oh, uh, certainly. Uh... Hmm. Ralph D. Spencer. Hey, we got some Spencers over Frog Holler. Would you be kin? Uh, no, not that I know of. Just as well. Wouldn't let you have the room if you were. It's the most shiftless, no account tribe. Well, Mercy is my name. Magnolia Sue Mercy. Hey, Gusta! You quit trying to choke me, Ellen! You planning to stay with us long? Uh, well, that depends. On what? On the situation. Well, supper served at six o'clock. Fried chicken, yams, black-eyed peas, greens, apple pie, and ice cream and coffee. Only 25 cents a day extra. Save your place at the table? Uh, well, I've always been a spendthrift. Uh, uh, I'll have the drumsticks. That's 10 cents extra. Hey, just Don't you dare hit me, Ellen, on the head with that hammer! <laughs> Once Jimmy had settled in at Mrs. Mercy's hotel, he decided to have a leisurely stroll down to the bank. Preparation. Painstaking, advanced preparation. That was the story of Jimmy Valentine's success. No general ever planned a military campaign more carefully. And so, bold as brass, Jimmy walked into the bank and asked to see the president. The president was a tall, stout, rather bald party who greeted Jimmy like a long-lost brother. <laughs> Sit down, sir. Have a chair. Thank you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> Adams is the name. Rudolph Gustavus Adams. Very much your service, Mr... Uh, Spencer. Ralph D. Spencer. Uh, how may I serve you, Mr. Spencer? First National Farmers and Merchants Bank of Elmore is at your disposal. Uh, Mr. Adams... I'm thinking of making a deposit in your bank, a rather substantial deposit. Oh, well, Mr. Spencer, let me assure you... Five thousand dollars. Five thousand? I hope it's not too much. Uh, Mr. Adams, I assure you, First National Farmers and Merchants Bank of Elmore has a host of substantial depositors. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Yes. We're a most conservative institution. I am concerned with your physical safety. Uh, physical safety? Yes. Do you have a strong, secure, and burglar-proof vault? Oh, we do. We do indeed. There isn't one to be found like it in old southern Arkansas. I have a fear. A deathly fear of burglars. Oh, <laughs> rid yourself of that fear at once. I wish I could. Yeah, come, let me show you our vault. Oh, no, I wouldn't want to put you to all that trouble. Trouble? Well, since when is setting a customer's mind at rest trouble? <laughs> you must inspect the vault. Uh, this handle here mm. activates the solid steel bolt. Ah, only one bolt, huh? Protection is adequate. It's more than that. Well, I was just kind of... Is there a time lock? Yes, a time lock? Well, like I say, I don't really know much about it, but I've heard of bank vaults that had time locks. Oh, that's window dressing. That doesn't mean a thing. Oh, yes, I'm sure you're right, sir. Of course I'm right. I bet my life on this vault. Uh, did you ever hear of a fella called Jimmy Valentine... Jimmy Valentine? No, I don't believe I ever did. You never heard of Jimmy Valentine? No. Who's he supposed to be? 
Uh, he's only supposed to be the most famous safe cracker in these United States of America. Oh. I'm willing to wager that even the great Jimmy Valentine himself would find it impossible to break into this here vault. Well, now, what a thing to say in front of our Jimmy. It only goes to prove the old adage, pride goeth before a fall. This little backcountry tin can, this could stop the likes of that peerless Jimmy Valentine? Well, uh, it is possible Mr. Adams knows something we don't. Everybody will know everything as soon as Act Two arrives. Dandy, dapper Jimmy Valentine, the most celebrated safecracker of the age, is, as we say, casing a bank in Elmore, Arkansas. What Jimmy has no way of knowing at this point is that this will be his last job. He's telling the story in a letter to an old friend, a man he met while both were in prison, a fellow he knew as Billy Porter and who the rest of the world came to know as O. Henry. Well, Jimmy's letter went on, the rube couldn't show me enough. Cracking this vault would be like taking candy from a very small baby. Billy, I was almost ashamed to do it. But it would be painless and fast. Anyhow, we go back to his office and he's got a look on his face like the cat that just ate the canary. <laughs> Poor sucker. Doesn't he know he's the canary? Mr. Adams, I am impressed. <laughs> I knew you would be. I have such a feeling of safety. Yes. Well, then, you will open an account with us? I won't rest easy till my money's deposited inside your vault. No, sir, it's the only place oh, for me. You won't regret it. I'll telegraph my bank in Little Rock to transfer my money here first thing in the morning. Oh, Papa, I didn't know you were busy. Oh, uh, come, come in, my dear. Uh, Mr. Spencer, I'd like to present my daughter, Annabelle. Annabelle, this gentleman's about to become one of our major depositors, Mr. Ralph D. Spencer. How do you do, Mr. Spencer? How do you... How do you do? And here's how he describes her in the letter. She was about five foot two, with wavy black hair, and sparkling black eyes, and the cutest trimmest figure you'd ever want to see. But that's only what she looked like. You know what she was, Billy? She was destiny. You remember how we used to talk about destiny back there in Columbus? Well, one look was enough, and I knew. I knew she was my destiny. Nothing else mattered. Nothing else existed. She was my destiny. How long are you planning to stay in town, Mr. Spencer? How long? Oh, indefinitely. Uh, eternally. Why, Mr. Spencer, you didn't say you'd plan to settle down here. Well, I don't see why not. It's a fine little place. Don't you think so, Miss Adam? Oh, I love it. Yes, as a matter of fact, I've come down here to... Uh, to look for a location to go into business. Really? Yes, this looks like a progressive community, wouldn't you say, Miss Adams? Oh, yes. I just decided to scout some sort of business opportunity. Well, business does well here, Mr. Spencer. Do you know what we don't have and could use? Oh, no, 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 my dear, this is a business discussion. What sort of business do you suggest, Miss Adams? Well... Do you know what we need in this town? No. A shoe store. A shoe store? Yes, a shoe store. There's not a single exclusive shoe store for miles around. I simply cannot believe my ears. You you did say a shoe store. Huh? How did you know? How did I know what? How did you know I was in the shoe business? You're, you're in the shoe business, Mr. Spencer? Born and raised in it. My dad owned and operated Spencer's Peerless Shoes in Chicago for 40 years. Well, <laughs> if that only... Uh, Miss Adams, I wonder if I might impose... Impose? Yes, I, I wonder if we... If you, that is... You see, I will require some 
guidance. Oh. I know enough to realize I don't know enough about my prospective customers. I'm a stranger. Now, I'm sure you know many of the ladies well, here. Well, Annabelle knows everybody worth knowing within 30 miles or so. Do you suppose you could tell me something about ooh, what they like? Uh, you know the styles and so forth? Well, Mr. Spencer, I'd be delighted. Now, let me see if I remember. Miss Brown likes a high heel. Mrs. Dawson is partial to... Mr. Spencer. Uh, uh, yes? There's no need to carry this charade further. Charade? You, Mr. Spencer, are a fraud. Why do you say that? A cheerful fraud and a charming fraud, but a fraud. How can you say that? You don't know anything about the shoe business, do you? Uh, <laughs> no. Then why did you say so? I wanted an excuse to get you alone. For what purpose? Miss Adams, I intend to marry you. Oh, we just met. Well, that's a good answer. What do you mean? Well, it's better than a lot of other answers, like impossible, or I happen to be engaged, or I wouldn't marry you if you were the last man on earth. Nothing's impossible, and I happen not to be engaged, and if you were the last man on earth, I'd be a fool to turn you down. Then there's hope. You are what is known, I believe, as a fast worker. And that's because life is so short. No. Life is long enough to do things properly, orderly. Oh, I'm all for that. What are you going to do about the shoe business? Uh, go into it. Even though you know nothing about it? Oh, I don't know anything about any legitimate business at all, but I can learn. Do you know something? I believe you can. I have a little capital uh, left to me by my grandfather. What business was he in? He sold Bibles. A most commendable calling. Yes. Now, um, about the other thing. What other thing? Our getting married. Oh. Well, time will tell. What will time tell? How you really feel about that. I already know. Do you? I'm not sure. Why? You're something new in Elmore, Mr. Spencer. Uh, Ralph. That's new for Elmore, too. A lady does not call a gentleman by his first name the first day she's met him. Why did you come here? Well, I'm tired of the big cities. I'm tired of the pace, the pressure, the competition. The real things of life are missing there. The real things of life? And what are they, Mr. Spencer? Oh, friendships. There are no friendships in the city? Well, maybe there are. You can find friendship and love and everything else in the city, but there's no time to enjoy them. Your life just seems to run away from you. You have nothing to show for it. And that's why you came to Elmore? Well, I didn't know about Elmore, but I was looking for a place like it. And when the train stopped here, I said to myself, why travel further? You found it. Are you sure? Positive. Why don't you try it for a while? I'm going to try it. For the rest of my life. You enjoy an apple more when you take small bites. Just try it for a while. Well, Billy, his letter continued. I did have the $5,000, and the next day, I put it in the bank. Her father's bank. It was a new experience, putting in instead of taking out. But all of a sudden, my life was full of new experiences. I'd opened a shoe store, and I'd become not just a shoe clerk, but a merchant. Can you tie that? After three months, I was even invited to join the Elmore Big Boosters Club. Gentlemen, I am honored to become a member of this civic-minded, progressive organization. What appeals to me most is the fact that the Big Boosters act like big brothers to youngsters who need advice and guidance, and can therefore be saved from entering a life of crime. Ah, yes, ma'am. Uh, what may I sell you today? Oh, Jimmy, I heard your speech was <laughs> wonderful. Well... Papa told me. And when you spoke about saving youngsters from a life of crime... Well, everyone was in tears. Well, I may have laid it on a little thick. Oh, no, Jimmy. Everyone could tell you spoke from the heart. I, uh... I'd like to remind you of something. Yes? It's been six months. The day we met, I asked you to marry me, remember? I remember. And you said, 
Mr. City Slicker? Oh, I said no such thing. Well, you meant it. You said, Mr. City Slicker, try our ways here for a while and then ask me again. Well, I've tried it. And? Well, I've built a business. I've become part of the town. Part of this very small town. Yes, and I love it. Jimmy. I want to stay here for the rest of my life. With you. Jimmy, I love you. Well, Billy, that's destiny. And you should take my advice and try it for yourself. We decided to get married right away. But first, I had something to do. I had one little loose end to tie off. One link with the past that had to be broken. So I made a telephone call to an old friend. Hello? Mike, it's Jimmy. Jimmy, my boy. Are <laughs> you all right? Fine, fine, Mike, fine. I, I was worried. I haven't heard or read a word about you in six months. Everything's fine. Are you sure? Yeah, Mike. Mike, I want to give you my tools. Jimmy, why? I quit the business. You quit the business? Oh, no. Tell me the sun quit shining and the rain quit falling. But don't and tell Mike, me... Mike, I got a nice little store. You got a store? A little shoe store. Oh, no, Jimmy. And next week I'm going to marry the finest girl on earth. She's an angel, Mike. She loves me. Jimmy Valentine. Married. The only life, Mike, is the straight one. I wouldn't touch a dollar of another man's money for a million. Jimmy, is this you? Mike, you're the only real friend in the whole world. Be here next Sunday. It's a little town called Elmore, Arkansas. I want you to stand up for me. Will you do it, Mike? Well, sure. Great. Now, I'll make you a present of the tools. I should drop them in the river, but uh, I can't. Oh, Jimmy, consider what you're doing. I've considered it. Uh, can you be sure it ain't just a passing fancy? <laughs> no, Mike, it's the real thing. Will you stand up for me next Sunday? Yes. Promise me you'll think it over, really think it over. After all, the good book says, can a leopard change his uh, spots? That's a question that's puzzled the pundits since time began. Isn't it true that a man must cling to his essential nature? Yes. But what is a man's essential nature? All his life, Jimmy Valentine has been a thief. For the past six months, he's been honest and reputable. Which is the real Jimmy Valentine? You know you have to wait for the third act to get the answer. But you won't have to wait long. Change of heart. Change of plan. Change of life. In midstream, in mid-career, a man suddenly reverses course. He sees a light. Once there was a man named Saul who lived in Tarsus who saw a light. A staid Parisian businessman named Gauguin saw another light. Now a young man named Jimmy Valentine has also seen a light. We know what that light is. It shines from the eyes of Miss Annabelle Adams. He's telling it all in a letter to an old friend, Bill Porter. Billy, could any man be happier? Did any man have the right to be so happy? My wedding day was less than a week off. Sooner it would be Sunday. I'd marry the finest girl in the world. And my best friend would be there to stand up for me. A man who'd been almost like a father to me. I was walking on air. Uh, let's see. It was Thursday morning, and I was about to leave my boarding house for the store. Good morning, Mrs. Mercy. Well, you look happy enough for a man who's about to take the deep plunge into the unknown. I'm so happy even you can't spoil it for me. Morning, Ralph. Ralph. Oh, Mr. Adams, good morning. Morning, Mr. Adams. Mrs. Mercy, what a weekend is it going to be for the Adams family? Sunday, my beautiful Annabelle gets married to the finest gentleman in the state of Arkansas, Mr. Ralph D. Spencer here. And Saturday, uh, go ahead, somebody ask me what happens on Saturday. What happens on Saturday? Only the best kept secret in town. 
That's what happens on Saturday. Ah. Well, what is the best kept secret in town, Mr. Adams? Uh, the only fitting and proper that you should ask, Ralph, my boy, since you're the man responsible. Me? Uh, think back, Ralph. Think back. The very first day you walked into the bank, you said you wanted to inspect the vault? Yes, I remember. Well, sir, then and there, I could have died of shame. Why? Look like a good, strong vault? Oh, to you. Because you knew nothing about them. But I sold you a bill of goods. You did? Yeah, Ralph, my boy, that vault, that little sardine can of a vault. Oh, now, Mr. Adams. I even bragged about how to keep out <laughs> Jimmy Valentine himself. Well, it could. You're saying it to make me feel good. Yeah. Well... I realize that you and all my customers deserve something better. Oh, really, Mr. Adams? And it's being installed right now. A new vault. A brand new vault. The latest, the strongest, the most burglar-proof vault in the whole world. We'd be ready on Saturday. And the whole town's invited to inspect it. We'll serve punch and cookies. Will you come, Mrs. Mercy? And perhaps it'll inspire you to open an account with us, <laughs> <laughs> say, say you'll come. Well, I'll come for the punch and cookies. I can't promise anything else. I never read a letter that was so filled with sunshine. And I was so happy for Jimmy. But that was Thursday. Something was going on that night that Jimmy was completely unaware of. Something that threatened to destroy the beautiful picture he saw as the rest of his life. Jimmy didn't know about it till much later, but at that moment, some 500 miles away, a friend of his, his best friend who owned a saloon, was behind his bar as usual. Hello, Mike. Hey, do I know you? Yeah, but that's not the question. Well, what's the question? Do you want to get to know me better? Well, where's all this going? The penitentiary. You're headed there now. Oh, I am. What have I done? What have you done? Well, let's see. You're a receiver of stolen goods. Who says so? A lot of people. Mostly a friend of yours. Sully. Sully? We have evidence. Testimony. Enough to fill a whole encyclopedia. Well, what if you do? I think it'll add up to 20 years. You're 46 now. Oh, dear. You'll get out at 66. Old, broken, good for nothing. On the other hand, I may not be going anywhere. All I have to do is make a telephone call. Uh, why don't you? I think I will. You deserve to be put in your place. <laughs> then I'll treat you to a drink or kick you out of here. Or would you like to bet? Or what? Uh, give me 2627. Uh, that it doesn't answer. Well, that'll be the day. It's your will. Is it ringing? Yes, yes, it's ringing. You still haven't taken the bet. I don't blame you. Well, Mike. Why don't you hang up? He's not there. Who, who's not there? Big John. Your connection into the governor's office. Who are you talking about? He's just been arrested. Big John. We've got him. Cold. You can't arrest Big John. Why not? The governor. The governor would never stand for it. Ordinarily. But the governor's been told he'll be allowed to finish his term if he keeps his hands off and retires from public life after his term is over. Next month, oh, yes, the, the, the governor. It was decided to avoid a scandal. Well, Mike. <laughs> what do you want? I want Jimmy Valentine. I don't know where he is. If you don't know, you don't know. Oh, you'll just do your full 20 years like a gentleman. I'm not a squealer. All right. I understand that. We've got to start someplace. Seven years. Now listen, boy. Here's what you can expect. 
And it's the best deal you can get. And only because everybody wants Jimmy so bad. Five years. Not a minute less. Five. That's a dirty business. Sure. He's like my kid brother. Abel was Kane's kid brother. Now look. He'll never know. Where do... That's life, I guess. So where do I find him, Mike? Saturday was a beautiful day. And the whole town was in a festive mood. Everybody was crowded into the bank, laughing and talking and marveling at the great new fantastic bank vault. <laughs> and so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there's nothing like it inside a little rock. Uh, this massive stainless steel door is fastened into place by three, now count them, one, two, three solid steel bolts that are thrown into place by this single handle. The crowning feature is this lock. This patented time lock. Only time can unlock this door once it's shut. You set her, and I'm going to now set her for 9 o'clock, 9 o'clock Monday morning. And a half hour from now, we close the bank for the day, we'll close the door. And no one, I repeat, absolutely no one will be able to open her again Till nine o'clock Monday morning. Oh, 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 Ralph. Ralph, I'm so happy. And look at Papa. It's such a wonderful day for him. Yes, there are going to be wonderful days for everybody. Hello, Mr. Spencer. Do I know you? Of course. Don't you remember me? I'm the fellow with the missing front tooth. Uh, could we talk in private? Uh, would you excuse us, Miss... Of course. Well, Jimmy, how do you want to do it? I don't know what you're talking about. Big John's out of the picture. The governor's in a straitjacket. This time, you'll get a fair trial. I'll listen, Price. And the burglar tools. <laughs> That'll be the icing on the cake. You'll have to find them. We'll find them, Jimmy. We'll turn the town upside down. Never. Not where I hit him. Uh, you're not grinning so strong now, are you, Price? Okay, go ahead, arrest me. But you don't have a thing to take to trial, and you know it. I'll find those two. Ah, oh, come on, Price. I know the law as well as you do. You just can't find them. You have to prove they're mine. You have to find them in my possession. I didn't wait this long and come this far to fail now. Okay, Price. Uh, if you'll excuse me. I don't know. I don't know. What, what, oh, what is it? What, what happened? Wait a minute, everybody. I, I can't open it. Oh. It can't be open until 9 o'clock Monday morning. Oh, you do, my friend. You're darling. You're darling. Oh, my God. Oh, do something. There, 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 there isn't anyone who can do anything. They, the lock, it won't open until oh, no. 9 o'clock Monday morning. Oh. It won't open. There isn't enough air in there. She'll die. Oh, please, please. I, I don't... I don't, I don't know what to do. Ralph? Oh, Ralph, is there anything that can be done? If anyone can think of something, you can. I, uh, I don't know. Oh, Ralph, think of something. You're not like anyone else. You're smart. But how can oh, I... Oh, darling, if someone doesn't think of something, that little girl will die. She will, won't she? Yes, she will. And no one can save her. I see that now. No one. Uh, Mr. Adams, Mr. Adams, ask everyone to leave the bank. Oh, 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 Having a celebration. Oh, Papa. Ralph, it's affecting yeah. his mind. It'll be all right. The little girl will be all right. Now, uh, I want to borrow your buckboard, and I shall be right back. What he did, he went to the secret hiding place. He returned with the hidden bag of burglar tools. There was a crowd outside the bank. I will need a gentleman to assist me. Uh, you, sir. I'll be happy to. Well, come with me, then. So, that's 
how it's done. On a slight angle, which is why it needs only the one hole. Hmm. And now? Now, we turn the knob and feel for the clicking. See? Uh, and now, we just swing the door open. I wouldn't have believed it possible. The little girl. Oh, she's all right. She uh, just fainted. Now, carry her out to her mother. Uh, do me a favor. Take the tools and wait for me in the buckboard outside. I want to say goodbye to someone. Of course. Hey, 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 my little girl. Here you are, Mrs. Mercy. Agatha, my precious little Agatha. Oh, Ralph, Ralph, oh, you went and done it. Ralph, you're a great man. Oh, Ralph, darling, you're wonderful. And I, uh, I have to go away for just a little while. What are you saying? I have to go with that gentleman. Go? Where? For how long? Tomorrow's Sunday. Please, darling, you understand after a while. Understand? What What will I understand? Sir? Sir, would you come over here, please? I'll get to the bottom of this. Where are you taking my fiancé? All right, Price, let's just get this over with. Huh? I'm sorry. Sorry? About what? Well, I carry a pretty good line of shoes, but uh, old uh, Ralph Spencer here... He's tough to sell. And I had my trip for nothing, looks like. Price, what what are you talking about? Looks like I was mistaken all along. Get up! Darling, who's that man? <laughs> I never saw him before in my life. And I don't think I ever will again. he didn't, because Detective Ben Price wasn't going to travel all the way back to Elmore, Arkansas to buy a pair of shoes. Now, don't you travel even so much as an inch, because I intend to return in just a few short minutes. <laughs> to some people, it comes as a surprise that William S. Porter or O. Henry, served a term in prison. Well, actually, he didn't really deserve it. He was working in a bank, a bank that was run in a very relaxed manner, and the missing sum was under $1,000. It was never definitely established that he was the one responsible. But, nevertheless, he went to prison. Our cast included Robert Dryden, Paul Hecht, Catherine Byers, Court Benson, and Ken Harvey. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. <laughs> This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs>